Shadow of the Erdtree's Remembrance bosses showcase some of From Software's finest work. But what about the little guys? The DLC has some great side bosses who were overshadowed by their more prominent counterparts. Today we're giving them some love by ranking every non-remembrance boss from worst to best. Spoilers ahead if you haven't finished the DLC. I'm gonna start by putting the good, bad and ugly of the reskin bosses in the trash. The Ghost Flame Dragons in Red Bears certainly stand out as the best of a bad bunch. With new designs and moves, they're as good as a reskin can get. I don't know why the Death Bird reared its pea head, but this encounter was horrendous. I didn't like them in the base game, and I'll tell you what, I certainly don't want them here. But the special dishonourable mention must go to Ancient Dragon Senesax. The already annoying lightning hitboxes became nightmare fuel in a body of water. Reskins are acceptable and do have a place in a game as large as Elder Ring, but here we have the worst selection of mini bosses from the base game, scaled up to the DLC's difficulty to the point it becomes tedious. I'm convinced the Golden Hippo is a last minute addition to the Shadow Key. After seven Soulsborne games, I refuse to believe he was intentionally put into this Harry Potter cupboard arena. In the trailer, we can see the Tarnish fighting him on a lake in the open. He would have been a lot less offensive had this been his arena. The lock on point being the middle of the body rather than the head doesn't do him any favours, as you're fighting the camera as much as the Hippo. Otherwise, he's straightforward, with bite attacks in phase one and ranged quill attacks in phase two. You're better off keeping your distance outside of his punish windows as the hitboxes are massive. If he wasn't in the Shadow Keep, I would avoid him altogether since the incantation he drops is doo doo as well. Chief Blood Fiend is the only boss I forgot existed after my playthrough. He's just very mediocre. You can find this Discord mod hanging out in a cave of his own filth. He functions like a normal Blood Fiend, with a few extra attacks like Moe's Blood Flame Talons. The camera here was also a pain since it was drawn to his blood sausage. I think if you take the Chief as a package with Rivermouth Cave, it's a decent distraction. Discovering a blood cult through the collapsing floor was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Don't actually have anything else to say about him. Probably what bleed users look like IRL. Moving on. Count Ymir is the first of many NPC quote unquote bosses on the list. He's very underwhelming to fight, with one projectile sorcery and a finger shield defensive spell. He also summons finger creepers to distract you. If you made it to this point of the DLC, you can defeat him in your sleep. In fact, his most threatening attack is having Jalan invading you before the fight. I think it would have been more impactful if Ymir was a part of the meter fight, absorbing her power and acting as a second phase rather than an NPC fight. But in his current state, he really just should have been an invader. Elden Ring's answer to Ronnie Pickering. Oh, Ronnie Pickering! Dryleaf Dane is another encounter that is pushing what I would consider a boss fight. Like Ymir, it seems unnecessary to stick a boss sized health bar on an NPC. However, Dane has the benefit of introducing you to Dryleaf Arts. Dryleaf Farts. <laughs> So you are fighting a unique NPC, giving it purpose. The moveset is so visually appealing, it gives you motivation to defeat him so you can start roundhouse kicking people in the head. I wish we had access to dry leaf arts before this fight so I could throw hands with Dane like a proper gentleman. Let's have a bare knuckle fight then! Next up, we have more NPC bosses. I'm going to group all the mausoleum encounters together. Although they vary in difficulty, they equally all do the same thing well. Like Dane, they showcase new weapons, armor, and ashes of war. So you can see what new loot you're going to be rewarded with for defeating them. I think your enjoyment of these fights comes down to whether you like PvP, as they have a different pacing to them. Rather than learning combos and punish windows, you're making a read, baiting attacks, and taking a risk when attacking. For me, I'm not going to be seeking these guys out in future playthroughs because I like the fight it'll be because I want the loot they drop instead. Special shout out to the Black Jail Knight for giving everyone who thought they were over leveled a reality check when entering the DLC. What if instead of being called Black Knight Garou, his name was Freaky Knight Garou, and instead of attacking you normally, he tried to tongue punch your fart box instead. Idrid and Garou are like the NPC fights as they serve to showcase new spells. Idrid has the Crucible Wings and Garou this frog tongue attack that for some reason we're not allowed. I find it hilarious they made this attack for one enemy and it's never seen again. Aside from that, they play like normal Black Knights. Idrid is certainly the more interesting of the two as we didn't see many twin blade enemies in the base game, and his weapon allows him to be more aggressive, chaining together longer combos. My build utilised the Crucible incantations, so it was fun to duke it out with him to earn my wings. I know I had a good whinge about reskins, but I think this one is pretty good. The Curse Blades are tough for regular enemies, identifying as Apache helicopters they spin to win, often creating space when you finally have a chance to attack, and Labyrinth cloaks the arena in darkness, making him feel like a proper assassin in the process. Blood, blood. 
Me bomba! The environmental change makes it difficult to predict, and the rocket propelled grab attack coming out of the shadows was terrifying. The curse blades are used sparingly in the land of shadow, and Labyrinth does enough to make himself unique from the regular variant. The Lamenter was such a troll. I'm probably ranking him too high, but I had such a laugh fighting him. He feels like an evolution of the Fool's Idol archetype of boss, as he summons clones intermittently. However, rather than ignoring the clones and weeding out the real Lamenter, you'll want to wipe the clones out quickly, as at the end of the phase you'll receive a debuff for each remaining clone. Too many debuffs and it's instant death. It took me far too long to figure the gimmick out. He disappears for so long before summoning the clones. I was trying to use the Lamenting Visage to find him. It was actually kind of tragic, okay? And the whole time, he's just mocking you with this stupid laugh. <laughs> Gimmick fights like this have a short shelf life, since once you know how to beat them, the challenge is gone. However, I'll give the Lamenter his 15 minutes of fame for giving me a good runaround. Next up is Ancient Dragon Man. He was fun for an NPC fight and a cool introduction to the Dragon Quest line, which is a large portion of the DLC. You first battle a weaker version as an invader before encountering his physical form in the cave. He puts up quite a fight as well. It's his job to test you and make sure you're worthy to continue up the Jagged Peak. Ancient Dragon Man. <laughs> Such a stupid name. The amazing Ancient Man Dragon. My name is the human spider. He uses a few dragon incantations, which did catch me off guard, but his main selling point is showcasing the Dragon Slayer Katana. One of the more unique NPC fights in the DLC, Man Dragon is okay in my book. Yori Elder Inquisitor has some good ideas. His summons feel like attacks rather than just adds, so you don't feel like you're getting ganked, and his spells aren't too annoying, forcing you to keep moving during the fight, such as the Spire Incantation. I think his high poise makes him divisive in the community, or rather, he doesn't flinch like you would expect a scrawny mage weakling to. I'd argue this makes him interesting as he becomes more of a threat than a boss like Renala, who is easy to bully into a stun lock. Otherwise, he would have been a forgettable pushover. Leda and her allies are the best NPC encounter from Software have made. It's not a boss, but it seems fitting to include them. Your actions throughout the DLC directly affect how the scenario unfolds. It was 5v1 in my playthrough until Tholier and the Goat Anne's back arrived to even the odds. And man, did I need the assist, because my former allies had me stressing. It's mandatory to take Freya down ASAP because she's an absolute unit. Hornscent has low HP, but his ranged attack has the potential to one-shot you. And don't even even get me started on more. Yeeting pots of Melania's bathwater. The dialogue feels like Shadow of the Erdtree's emotional climax, with several NPC questlines wrapping up here. Genuinely, this is the best implementation of NPC questlines from Soft has done, and I'm looking forward to where they take it in the future. Demi Human Swordmaster on set the bar too high for dungeon bosses. He was the first boss I fought after the Black Jail Knight, and he's Yoda. He's basically Yoda. Surprise. I steamrolled him initially as he's easy to poise break. However, when he fights back, he has some serious moves. His agility paired with his stature make him a little whirlwind of death. And once he starts attacking, he doesn't stop. He hits surprisingly hard too. And the blue aura on his attacks is so visually appealing. Definitely on the easier side, but that doesn't make him a bad fight. You'd be forgiven if you didn't recall Crucible Knight Devonia. Almost no effort went into her presentation. Despite being one of the DLC's more unique encounters, she technically isn't a boss, which I find sad because she's well designed, incorporating everything you would expect from a Crucible Knight, from devastating slow wind-ups to ground stomps and shape-shifting incantations. Although she absolutely has the worst helmet of the three. Like, what is that? Come on! Devonia's centaur transformation attacks are the highlight of the fight. It it wouldn't surprise me if Fromm got overly ambitious with Devonia and rushed the rest of the encounter. It would explain the absence of music and recycling Ordovus's vortex on the hammer. I have a theory the Crucible Knights were intended to have a wider role in the DLC. Idrid and Gary both use Crucible incantations and share the Urtry Knight music track, played for Tree Sentinels and Crucible Knights. Pure speculation, as this pet originally intended to be Crucible Knights but changed to Mesmer Knights instead, as Crucible incantations were exclusively used by Crucible Knights before these two. It would explain why they were gifted boss status. Let me know what you think below. The Death Knight is as close as we'll get to a Godwin the Golden fight. Michael Zaki heard the complaints about the catacomb bosses and cooked. I went through the fog wall fully expecting an Erdtree watchdog. Safe to say, 
these guys blew me away. Both variations have a nice flow to the fight, balancing long combos with clear openings. The visual spectacle of them zipping around the arena made me feel like I had stumbled onto something special. They're relatively well tuned, however this is another boss that could benefit from a small buff as the Death Knight has weak poise compared to the other bosses in the DLC. The grab attack comes out quickly, but if you learn the visual cues it's easily avoided. The Death Knight sucking the life out of you to heal himself is fitting for Godwin's personal guard. Paired with G-Man's face in the background, these guys got me hyped for a Prince of Death boss fight at the end of the DLC. <laughs> <laughs> Agree, disagree, tell me your ranking in the comments below. Take it easy and I'll see you on the next one.